speak to you today. Um, thank you also for coming. It's great to have you here. And especially to the kids. Uh, it's very exciting to see a lot of kids here. Thank you. Um, this is right around the age when I started to get, to get excited about science. So hopefully I can do a little bit to uh, help get the kids here excited about spending a lot of time uh, researching things. Now, that's not to say thank you, not also thank you to the adults for being here. Uh, in particular, I'm very excited because I grew up in the area, so I'm very excited to have my parents here. My parents live here. Um, we wanted to <laughs> So if you were to have taken your telescope, your very nice backyard telescope, actually, maybe not just a backyard telescope, but a very, very nice telescope, and looked at the, the galaxy Messier 101 in 2011, this is what you would have seen. Okay, so this is February of 2011, and it's a lovely galaxy. It's called the Pinwheel Galaxy. Okay. But if you were to keep taking pictures, taking images of this throughout the next year, what you would have seen is a supernova go off. So there it goes. Maybe you missed it. Let's go back and find it again. February 2011. And this is August 2011, and we'll see over the next few months if it rises and fades right there. Right? So this is by May of 2012, it's more or less shown. So that's one supernova, a relatively, uh, actually very close by supernova. But supernovae are happening all over the, all over the galaxy, or sorry, all over the universe, all throughout time. And so this movie is a compilation of uh, supernovae over the past five or so years. Compiled by a graduate student in the department, Isaac Shivers. It's a very lovely visualization. Okay, this is the past five years, and what you'll see is a bunch of supernovae going off all across the sky. So this is the plane of the Milky Way, and out with the plane of the Milky Way are all these other galaxies, and we'll see these supernovae go off. Now this is not the actual images of the supernovae, it's just a visualization, but it gives you an idea of how many supernovae go off. This is the time, 2011, 2012, 2013, and so on. Okay, and you can obviously see there are a ton of supernovae. There's something approaching a thousand or more supernovae going off uh, every year throughout the universe. Yes, please. Oh, yes, and I should say, please feel free to ask questions. So is that an artifact, the fact that it seems to go down and up? Is that seasonal or something? Uh, that was a very good thing to notice. Okay, so you can see that there are a bunch up here, there are a bunch down here, and a bunch up here. Um, to be honest, I haven't exactly checked this, but it must be the fact that the sun, the silly sun, is in the way during the day. You can't see the sky during the day because the sun is in the way. And so, during these seasons, the sun happens to be in that part of the sky, uh, so we won't be able to see it. Yeah, I noticed that the, uh, there's a, a lot of them and a little of them in a pattern that moves across the sky. So, uh, this is being taken from one location or Sorry, these, these supernovae are just, uh, these were detected by the entire supernova community throughout the world. So. Oh, no, no. Uh, okay. So the main point of this uh, visualization is just to show you that there are a ton of supernovae going off every year. Uh, not all of these were type 1a supernovae, but something like a little more than half of them were. Okay, so there are hundreds of type 1a supernovae going off every year, more than one per day is being a circus. The size of the circle, is that additions or the strength or what? Uh, just the brightness. And so it's a, it's a function of both how intrinsically bright it is and also how far away it is. So things that are closer by will appear brighter even. Yes, please. Uh, so is there, any, is there any difference between the size of a type 1 and a type 2? Or are we looking at both uh, different? That's right. So all these circles are any kind of supernovae that's been uh, detected. So both type 1a, type 1b, type 2, etc. And it's true that the different types have different uh, peak luminosities, how bright they actually get. So all that's being folded in here. Okay, so type 1 is supernovae. There are a ton of them, right? They're all over the place. 
Uh, okay, and so let's let's be a little more quantitative. Oh, sorry, I should just explain this first. If you were to take your telescope, you point it at a supernova, and you measure how much light is coming through as a function of time, you can uh, generate what's called a light curve. So it's just a, a plot of how bright that supernova is as a function of time. Oops, that's the movie. It's a lovely movie, though. And that's what this plot yeah, is, is an example of. It's an example of a bunch of type 1a supernova light curves as a function of time. So on the x and the y axis, you have the brightness, how bright the supernova is at a certain day. And on the x-axis, you have whatever day it is. Okay? And they're all shifted in time so that they peak at the same time. Okay? And so you can see some general trends. So the supernova rises in luminosity over a period of something like 20 days or so. And then it fades over you know, another couple months. Okay? So if you just take your telescope, you point it at the supernova, and you keep measuring how many photons are coming through, that's what you get. And again, this is a, a maybe 10 or so different uh, type 1a supernova. Typed by, or uh, just labeled by their color. Uh, remind us again about the magnitude. I want you to uh, yes, I, I should have just I should have just uh, limited, you know, whited out that, that region because astronomers can be very confusing. And uh, one of the confusing things about astronomy is that brightness is measured in magnitudes, and magnitude scale goes negative. So the brighter something is, the more negative it is, and that's very confusing. Uh, it took me a long time to terms of that, but that is, you know, historically how it works. So brighter things have a lower, more negative magnitude. Okay, but that is not important for uh, the science of type 1a supernovae. But that's logarithmic. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Now, it was noticed, or realized, in the early 90s that you could do something very exciting with these light curves of type 1a supernovae. Okay, so that's that same plot, just a compilation of a few type 1a supernovae. You notice that some of them don't get as bright, some of them get brighter, okay? So there's a difference in how bright they ever get. And there's also a difference in how rapidly they rise to that brightness. So for example, this red one got to its brightness, you know, its maximum uh, brightness in something like 15 days or so. Whereas this really bright one, this black one up here, rose uh, and got much brighter, but also took 20 or so days to get there. So there is some sort of relationship between how fast, how rapidly the supernova is evolving, and how bright it ever gets. And if you can correct for that brightness, if you can correct for that difference in time scales, uh, you can put them all in the same plot. Okay? So now this is the corrected brightness, and they very magically, or not, maybe not so magically, but very nicely, all line up very close. So now all these different light curves look very similar. And what that means is very exciting. It means that you have a way to measure the, uh, to know the intrinsic luminosity of the type 1a supernova. You know how bright it really is. What you can do with that is just like a candle, when you look at it up close, it's very bright and far away, it's dimmer. Now you can use these type 1a supernovae and see them go off in a galaxy far, far away. You know, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, you can see them go off and know that you know, they should be this bright, but they're actually dimmer. And so I know how far away that galaxy is. Right? Just like the candle is close by, it's bright, it's far away, it's dim. These type 1a supernovae, I know how, how bright they should be. and so. Uh, given their apparent brightness, how bright they appear to be, I know how far away the galaxy that they exist in is. Okay. So this is very, very useful because in the universe, you don't have rulers, right? You can't go to that galaxy far, far away and say, oh, this is that far away from us because you know, there are no rulers, so not in, not in the classical sense. But these type 1a supernovae are very bright. You can see them very, very far away. You can use them basically as a ruler to tell you how far away these galaxies are. Okay. So that's great. That's very, very useful. Uh, and here's the Earth, right? We're here on Earth. It's, I originally had a blue, but we're in a drought, so now it's brown. <laughs> Hopefully it'll, it'll turn blue this winter. Okay, so the next piece of the puzzle is not to do with type 1a supernovae, but to do with something called redshift. So this may be familiar to you, it must be familiar to you in your daily life. You hear an ambulance coming up behind you, it's coming towards you, and you hear the, the siren is higher pitched. Right? And as it passes you, the siren goes to a lower pitch. And that's called the Doppler shift. We all are quite familiar with that. It's, it's happening because the ambulance is coming to you, and the sound waves are being you know, emitted, uh, they're being compressed. Okay, and so the wavelength of the sound is smaller, it's shorter. It's a higher frequency uh, pitch of sound. And as the ambulance passes you, the, the sound waves are being stretched apart, so it goes down to a lower pitch, a lower, a lower frequency. In a very, very analogous way, when we look at galaxies, 
we see them all receding away from us. They're all trying to get away from us. Okay? And we can tell because the light that's coming from them is redshifted, just like this ambulance that's going away from us. The sound is redshifted. All these galaxies, when we look at them, the light is redshifted. Okay? So the light is coming out uh, redder than it would otherwise be if we were right next to the galaxy. So every galaxy we look at, it's receding away from us. The further ones are receding even faster. Okay? And this has been known for, for decades in the Hubble law. So it's just saying that the further away a galaxy is, the faster it's, it's trying to get away from us. Yes? Since the frequency changes, how do you know it's not the color that's changing? <laughs> this is getting a little more complicated. Yes. <laughs> that's true. Um, so uh, as I'll get into a little bit later, uh, Different atoms emit and, uh, emit and absorb in different frequencies of light. And you can see um, in something called a spectrum, which I'll show in a bit, uh, you can try to match that spectrum to what we know and love on Earth and say, well, actually, all these lines have been redshifted by a certain amount. And they're all redshifted. So it's not just that there's some sort of evolution happening. It's really that those galaxies are moving away from us. Okay. So type 1a supernovae gave us a measure of the distance to faraway galaxies. We can look at the light of those galaxies and measure how fast they're going away from us. So we have a distance, and we can tell how fast they're receding from us. Okay? We can put those two on a plot. And that's what was done uh, maybe 20, 20 or 15 years ago. This very famous plot. It's a little complicated, but it's uh, very important, so I wanted to show it and try to explain it to you. So let's look at this top plot. Okay, this is showing each of these data points is showing a different type 1a supernova. And plotted on the y-axis is how bright that supernova got. At its, peak mag at its peak luminosity. And now the arrow goes down. The brighter things are down here, and the dimmer things are up here. So that's the y-axis, how bright those supernovae got. And again, that's a proxy for the distance to the galaxy in which they took place. On the x-axis, is showing how fast those galaxies are moving away from us. Okay, so the recession velocity. So these things down here, they're very bright, type 1a supernovae. They're bright because they're close. Okay? And the close things are not receding very fast. The things that are dimmer are very far away, and as I said, they're receding faster away from us. Okay, so the things that are close are receding, but the things that are far away are receding even faster. And again, qualitatively, that was not a surprise. That's been known for decades. Okay. So what? Yes. You are you are um, not using the corrected brightness there. You're using the observed brightness. Um, I believe um, uh, it must be the case that these are corrected. So it's the apparent. Luminosity, so it looks it's what it looks like it is, but also corrected for the time scale of the, the sequence. Right, so it's not exactly what we would have seen, it's, it's corrected. Yes? And the recession velocity, that's uh, the intercession velocity out of the galaxy uh, in the preceding image, if that were on this um, uh, scale. So you're saying for a given redshift, how fast is that yeah. actually moving away from us? So it doesn't scale perfectly linearly. Um, at, the, at the lower redshifts, it's roughly multiply that times the speed of light. That's roughly how fast the things close by are moving away from us. Obviously here, you know, one times the speed of light is the speed of light. These things are not moving the speed of light away from us because... Uh, no, sure they are. Uh, sorry, so... Oh gosh, this is really uh, embarrassing. And it's being recorded. That's <laughs> <laughs> just awful. But uh, maybe we'll edit it. Yeah, okay. They're moving faster away from us, and uh, you know, off the top of my head, I have an answer, but it could be wrong, so I don't want to say it out loud. <laughs> Anyone's watching this, and Tommy, anything you're I'm so sorry. Uh, yes, okay, but it's faster. <laughs> All right, let's pretend that question never happens. <laughs> All right, so these things are moving away from us faster than the ones here. Okay, very fast. Approaching the speed of light. And uh, um, the important thing was not just the qualitative, the fact that they're moving faster away from us, but the quantitative. Okay. In particular, what happens when you try to fit a model of your understanding of the universe to what you expect this plot should look like? Right. So you want to try to match this data, matching the distance to the supernovae versus the recession velocity to our understanding of the universe. And you have some model, and you fit the data. Okay. 
And that's what uh, is best shown in this plot, which is showing basically the same data. It's just subtracting out your model of the universe, your best fit model for the universe. The best fit model is uh, on this plot, it's, you're subtracting out the best fit model, so the best fit model is a zero. Okay? So it's just a horizontal line right, going basically through the data of these type 1a supernovae. The really interesting thing, though, was that our uh, naive idea for what the universe should look like or should behave like in the 90s was this model, was this line. And it was not the best fit model. This is a model for the universe that's made of matter, it's made of stuff. And that's, you know, what we think the universe could be like, right? That's the simplest idea. But it turned out to be wrong. The universe is not just made of matter. There's other stuff out there. The other stuff showed up uh, in this best fit model to the data from these type 1a supernovae. Now, in case you're a little worried, uh, you know, the difference between these two lines isn't that big on this plot. And it's really being driven by these supernovae that are very far away, and there are only a few of them. So maybe just statistically, you know, by chance, uh, the people got unlucky, and so they made this claim that it wasn't true. Okay, but this is a compilation, sorry, and that was a compilation from the uh, late 90s, okay? This is a compilation from uh, just last year, a whole bunch of other supernovae that have been uh, observed in the past 15 years. And there are a whole lot more points, as you can see. And so the axes have shifted a little bit, but basically this is the high redshift end. This is the very far away end. And there are a ton more supernovae. Okay, so, uh, it's much more clustered. All right, and indeed, this uh, best fit model still is a universe that is not just matter, but it's a whole bunch of other stuff. And what do I mean by other stuff? It's other stuff that has been termed dark energy. So 70% of the energy density of the universe is in the form of dark energy. Yes. Just to clarify the two models, the traditional model is just basically a bunch of stuff you throw up under gravity alone. And then the new one, you say, is moving a little faster. Sure. Okay. That works. Then the one that would be a traditional suit. That's right. Okay. That's right. Um, so in, in a, a little more words, this dark energy that's making up 70% of the universe is, as he said, it's causing these faraway galaxies to recede even faster than we would have otherwise assumed. Okay. So if it were just gravity, you know, it's fine, they're still coasting out. But we found instead <laughs> by using these type 1a supernovae that these faraway galaxies aren't just coasting out, but they're accelerating out. They're getting, you know, expanded even faster and faster than just coasting would, would predict. Yes? How does dark energy differ from the fictional, supposedly fictional concept of uh, anti-gravity? Causes a you know, it's actually quite similar to anti-gravity. I'm not entirely sure how you're thinking of anti-gravity, but it is very much an anti-gravity sort of uh, force. It's really pushing, you know, acting in the exact opposite way of what gravity would act on regular matter that we know and love. And that makes, a, as the supernovae found out, 70% of the, of the universe. It's crazy. Another wedge, giant wedge, I should just mention, this is not due to type 1a supernovae discovering this, but uh, a large part of the regular matter is not what we actually are made of, what we know and love, what's in the sun, what's on earth, what's in us. That's just 5%. Okay, that's just 5% is of the universe is in the form of this kind of stuff. Right? Another 20, or roughly 25% is in the form of this dark matter that we cannot see. Right? It does not emit light in the standard way, but we see it acting gravitationally on everything else. So that's been known, again, for decades that there are a lot of the universe is made up of dark matter. It's not like us, but at least, at the very least, it behaves gravitationally like we expect. Okay, so it wasn't, you know, by the time of the 90s, people had sort of come to grips with this and were comfortable with it. We don't, we still to this day don't know what it is, but at least you're okay with it. This 70%, you know, that was great, that was mind boggling because here all of a sudden, uh, most physicists had you know, definitely did not assume that 70% of the universe was made up of this dark energy that's expanding everything away from dark matter, couldn't it be some uh, stars that have died a long time ago? And, uh, That's right. So there are there are various experiments to exactly say something, you know, what percentage of this dark matter could just be regular matter that we don't see because it's very cold, for example. Uh, and limits have been placed on that, and it's they're not high enough to actually explain all the dark matter that we see. Okay. Yes? Uh, farther away, going faster. Yes. Closer, going slower. That's right. It occurs to me that it could be saying that the expansion of the universe is slowing down. In other words, it, long ago, it was going much faster. Oh, I see what you're saying. Close, it, closer, less time ago, 
more recent. It's going slower. Maybe it's slowing down. Right. So, so what I'm. Uh, it is a bit of a complex. Uh, I see some smiles. <laughs> it is a bit of a complex um, idea to to wrap your head around. Okay, and it, but it's, it's just the fact that um, the expansion is the, the the speed of the expansion is scaled to how close something is. So even you know, because these galaxies are close by, they're not expanding as fast away from us. But if you were to try and draw that straight line, something like what you were saying, it just it, it doesn't fit. Okay, so this is. Um, yeah, I should say this is not the point of the talk. The point of the talk was not just cosmology. It's actually when I supernovae. Uh, <laughs> I will hopefully get there. Uh, okay. All right. So this was a momentous uh, achievement, a momentous discovery. And it wasn't really a question of if a Nobel Prize would be awarded for it, but really when. So this was in the late 90s. And uh, indeed, the Nobel Prize was awarded four years ago for this, for this work. I just wanna, uh, these are the three recipients of the Nobel Prizes and their teams that really um, did the work that allowed uh, for, this, for this discovery. I wanted to highlight Saul Perlmutter because he's a local. He's, uh, he and the Supernova Cosmology Project are based at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, just up the hill. Um, there are also there are definitely a lot of people in this picture that are still at Berkeley. Um, also, Adam Reese and Brian Schmidt, who uh, helped lead the high Z Supernova team. In that picture, somewhere in there, is Alex Filipenko. And uh, many of you probably know Alex Filipenko is a professor in the department. He's a very engaging speaker and does amazing research. And he contributed heavily to both of these teams. OK. So type 1 supernovae, very exciting, very, very useful for their role in uh, determining how we understand the universe, how the universe evolves. Okay, very, very fundamental stuff. And there's sort of a little joke in the supernova community when you write a grant proposal or a, a paper in your introduction, you say something, you know, one or two sentences saying type 1 supernovae are extremely important for their utility as cosmological probes. And it's absolutely true. If you're outside the supernova community, one way to immediately get your interest is well, these things helped us, you know, helped us realize what the universe was actually made of. But that's definitely not what got me into the supernova field. What got me into the supernova field is that type 1a supernovae are incredible. They're really, really exciting things. Okay, for a brief period of time at the peak luminosities, there's something approaching or even uh, uh, surpassing the luminosity of their entire host galaxy. So for a few days, this death of the star is shining brighter than tens of billions of other stars in the host galaxy. And that's amazing, right? That's great. They're basically giant explosions in space. And if that doesn't get someone interested, I don't, you know, I don't know what will. That's the most exciting thing. Yes. Just for the record, this is an honest photograph with the Hubble telescope, not that kind of superposition or something. Or? Oh, it's definitely a superposition of, um, a, okay, definitely Hubble, but also maybe Hubble, but also Chandra. It's an X-ray telescope. An X-ray is. You can't see the colors of x-rays. We are not equipped to see x-rays, right? So it's been definitely a false color image. Um, and then superimposed to the, the, the deep field background, or? Uh, or sure. just These are uh, pretty. An actual recoloring of, of, of what the Hubble saw. Oh, you mean these stars out here? Yeah. Uh, these Pretty stars strong. out here are certainly not from the image that produced this, these okay. fluffy green. So it is a, it is a superposition. Yes. To one that ties up. Oh, no, 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 absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So that's, that's a picture if we can see. That's right. We, our eyes are really good at yeah. detecting all these different frequencies of light. This is what we can see. Um, I should I probably explain this. I wasn't planning on explaining it, but I showed it. I should probably explain it. This is an image of the Tycho supernova remnant. So this is a supernova, type 1 supernova that went off in our own galaxy about 400 and odd uh, years ago. And it was uh, first noticed by Ty Tycho Brahe, a very famous astronomer back in the day. Um, at the time, it was just a point. Okay, it was you know a new star in the sky. It's very interesting to an old astronomer because you know the stars are all fixed, and all of a sudden here's a new star. Um, this is 400 years later. We go back with X-ray telescopes and, and optical telescopes and look at what that supernova now looks like. And then in the intervening 400 years, it's expanded such that it doesn't look like it's just a point, but it's really a, a, a full thing that's expanded into its surrounding medium, and it gives you all this lovely. All these lovely features. But I'm not going to really talk about supernova remnants. That's plenty of fuel for another talk. Okay. So type 1 supernovae. I study them because they're really exciting. Uh, I study them for their intrinsic value. But they're also very, very important for all sorts of other things. They, as I said, we use them to do cosmological studies. They also are the main or one of the main sources of a lot of the elements 
in our bodies that, that stars formed out of. So, for example, half or so of the iron in our Earth and uh, in us comes from Type 1A supernovae that have gone off in the past billions of years. Uh, a lot of the silicon in, in this computer comes from Type 1A supernovae. Okay, so they have a great deal of impact in other fields and in our own lives. Okay? But I study them for their intrinsic uh, interest. Okay. So again, this was that plot from uh, the beginning of the talk where I showed a bunch of type 1A supernova light curves. Again, this is the brightness. How bright they get is a function of time. Okay. And just from that, just from taking your telescope, basically, and collecting the photons that are coming in from the supernova, you can do something interesting. Okay, there's a characteristic time scale that it takes for these uh, supernovae to rise to their maximum luminosity and then to fall away. And it's a order of a few weeks or so, a few weeks, a couple months, something like that. And that time scale tells you something interesting. What's happening is that the light is trying to get out of this exploding ball, okay? And it can't just go straight to us, you know, straight from the explosion to our telescopes and our eyes, because there's a whole bunch of stuff in the way. Okay, this exploding ball has a lot of stuff, so it takes a long time for the light to get out of that stuff and to us. So in this very hokey uh, diagram, here's the light coming through, and it's trying to free stream through space, but all of a sudden, oop, it encounters some little nucleus or atom inside the supernova, and it interacts with it. It gets absorbed or it gets scattered. All right, so it gets bounced off. Now it's going this way, and it has to interact with a whole bunch more of these uh, of this stuff before it can actually get out of the supernova and into our telescopes. So the longer it takes that supernova to rise to its maximum light, that's telling us that there's more stuff. The more stuff there is, the more stuff there is to block, the light, and the longer it takes the light to get to us. So the fact that it takes a few weeks for the supernova to rise to its maximum luminosity tells you something about how much mass, how much stuff there is in the supernova. And roughly speaking, there's something like the mass of the sun inside these supernova. So a solar mass, right? It's the mass of the sun. There's roughly, more or less, a solar mass's worth of stuff inside these type 1a supernovae. And that's preventing the light from getting to us, and that's why they take a few weeks to rise to their maximum luminosity. So just from taking the telescope and collecting photons, you learn something very interesting, or very useful, about these type 1a supernovae. There's roughly the sun's worth of mass inside of it. Okay. That's not all astronomers do. They don't just take their telescopes and collect photons. They can also do interesting things with those photons. In particular, you might remember from elementary school what happens when you pass light through a prism. Okay. Prisms disperse light, and they disperse it differently based on the wavelength of the light. So if you take white light and you pass it through this prism, um, maybe I should have had the demonstration, but I did. Uh, you disperse the light, and the red gets scattered you know, a certain amount, the blue gets scattered down here. And so if now if I were to take my detector and my telescope and collect this light, it's been spread out. I can tell how much red light there was in the supernova. I can tell how much blue light there was in the supernova. And you can do very interesting things with the dispersing, the disper dispersion of this light. So this is the sun's light, the solar spectrum. Uh, it's been dispersed through a fancy prism, essentially, and collected onto some uh, detector. I should just uh, mention, in case it's confusing anyone, the, the dispersed light actually goes here, and then it continues over here. So it's not like the dispersed light was all stacked. On, it's just stacked on top of each other, so you can see it on this slide. Okay. But basically, we're taking sunlight, passing it through a prism, and it spreads out just like in the previous slide. And something you can note very, yes, please. So are, are those dark spots on the split? Are those the Fraunhofer lines from the sun? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> they are precisely the Fraunhofer lines. So Fraunhofer was, uh, I believe, a German, German physicist, um, a German astronomer back in the day, centuries ago, did exactly this experiment and noticed that there are these bands. And he, you know, early times, any time you discovered a new thing, you could just name it after yourself. These days, it's a little harder to discover a new thing. So. Uh, but anyway, back in this glory, the glory days, these are now Fraunhofer lines. Okay, so these bands that are very noticeable to you are what happens when you take the sun and you pass it through spectrum. These bands are really useful. Right? The bands are telling you what the sun is made of. Let me explain that. So here's a cartoon diagram of the hydrogen atom. Okay, it's a very silly diagram, but just for uh, illustrative purposes, here is the hydrogen atom. It's a proton and it has an electron uh, around it. And you might remember from, from your chemistry classes or physics classes that 
uh, atoms have very specific energy states. Okay, this is the part where it gets a little complicated, but the electrons can only exist in very discrete shells of energy. So for example, here's this electron in this shell. If I want to move it to this shell above it, it takes a, a very certain amount of energy to do so. If I have too little energy, it won't get up there. It won't get halfway there or something. You can't get halfway, but you can only go the full way. So if I have too little energy, it won't do it. If I have too much energy, it won't do it. I need you know, the Goldilocks energy to change the electron into the next energy state. So here comes a red photon. It's you know, wiggling by. Okay, and it sees, you know, it's passing by the hydrogen atom, but it doesn't have enough energy to move that electron up to the next state. Okay, here comes a blue photon. It's coming by. It has too much energy. All right, this is sounding just like Goldilocks. It has too much energy, and so it also doesn't interact with the hydrogen atom because it doesn't have the right frequency. But here comes, you know, Mr. Or Mrs. Green electron, green green photon, sees the electron, has exactly the right energy to kick it up into the next state. Okay. Now when I have my detector here, the red light comes through, the blue light comes through, but that green light got absorbed by the hydrogen. And so there'll be a missing photon, there'll be missing light at that exact energy because there was hydrogen in the way, and hydrogen absorbs light at that energy. So if I made a plot of what my detector sees over here, um, uh-oh, I'm losing energy. I'm losing energy. <laughs> um, I see the intensity. Here's the intensity on the y-axis and the wavelength of the light on the x-axis. The red light makes through, the blue light makes it through, but the green is absorbed because there's hydrogen in the way and it's, it sucks those photons out of the, out of the light coming through. So you can use these absorption features as sort of a fingerprint to tell you what's inside the thing that is shining. Right, so again, here are all these front offer lines, these absorption lines in the solar spectrum. And they're telling us that the sun, what, what it's made of, it's made of hydrogen, you know, sodium, calcium, blah, 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 all these things. Okay? And we can tell not by going to the sun and collecting some sun and bringing it back, but by looking at the light and dispersing it through prism and seeing these lines. So in an exactly, directly anal analogous way, we can take the light from the Type 1A supernova, pass it through a fancy prism, and play the same game. So it's exactly the same kind of plot. Uh, it's just a little more quantitative. This is showing five different type 1A supernovae, uh, just to show you a little bit of the diversity. And you can see these very, very strong features due to the absorption of light by the stuff that's inside the type 1A supernova. Okay. Uh, you can see a very strong line here. It's due to calcium. Okay. There's some, a bunch of lines around here. They're due to silicon and iron. Okay. A very strong line here. Uh, that's due to silicon. Okay, so silicon is very good at absorbing these photons, and it does so at a wavelength around 600 nanometers, 6,000 angstroms. So if you see this spectrum, it tells you immediately that there's silicon inside the type 1A supernova, there's calcium, there's iron, it tells you what's inside. One very noticeable thing, um, I mean, I don't expect any of you to realize it off the bat, but there's no hydrogen. There are no absorption features due to hydrogen here. There should be some around here. There's nothing there. Okay. There's also nothing due to helium. There are no helium lines. There are no hydrogen and no helium lines. And it's telling you that there's no hydrogen or helium inside type 1A supernovae. And that's really interesting because, as you might know, the entire universe is dominated by hydrogen and helium. By mass, 98 or so percent of you know, the solar system and the galaxy is made of hydrogen and helium. And the stuff that is very exciting to us, things like silicon, sulfur, calcium, iron, etc., only makes up 2% by mass of, of um, what we know. Okay. So most of the universe is hydrogen and helium, but these supernovae don't show any of it. So something very interesting has happened to cause them to not have hydrogen or helium. Okay. So you can do this with type 1A supernovae, pass them through, spect or pass them through prism, make spectra of them. And it was found in the 40s and 50s that a bunch of supernovae look like this. Okay, they have these strong silicon features. They don't show evidence of hydrogen and helium. And so back in the day, well, you know, we'll just throw them in a category. We'll call them type 1A supernovae. Uh, and this was done by a few people, including Rudolf Minkowski and Fritz Zwicky. And you may notice, you may have seen this picture before. Uh, Fritz Zwicky is a famous astronomer, uh, was a famous astronomer. Uh, but I think one of the main reasons why it's such a famous picture, obviously, you know, he's looking like a goofball, right? And it's, <laughs> there's something, uh, 
know, very fun for, for us to see. These esteemed researchers and scientists look like you know, silly people. Uh, you probably you know, must have in your head the picture of Albert Einstein sticking his tongue out. There's something very you know, fun to see uh, these serious, you know, possibly serious people actually not be serious. Uh, something I, I noticed while putting together this talk for the first time, uh, he has a bolo tie. You never see bolo ties anymore. I think that should come back in fashion. Um, another thing to say, I think one of the reasons uh, you probably haven't seen this picture is because Minkowski looks kind of scary. Um, you contrast that with this you know, goofy guy, I think it's not surprising that you haven't perhaps heard of Rudolf Minkowski. Okay, anyhow. Um, so you take the spectra of various supernovae, you can identify what's inside of them based on their spectral features. Type 1 supernovae, they put these in classes, type 1 supernovae didn't have hydrogen. And again, that was very interesting, Almost, you know, a lot, the universe is mostly made of hydrogen and helium. But these supernovae didn't show hydrogen. There is also a class of other supernovae that do show hydrogen. And I think you mentioned type 2 supernovae. So type 2 supernovae do have hydrogen. You can find in these classifications a little better. Type 1 supernovae don't have hydrogen, and if your type 1 supernovae also don't have helium and show very strong silicon and iron and calcium, things like that, we'll call them type 1a supernovae. So that's why these supernovae are called type 1a supernovae. And also, there are various other classes of supernovae. You just kind of throw some letters on these, these designations, and it's basically going to be a supernova. So you have type 1b, type 1c, 2p, 2l, 2d, 2n, and this continues. Um, so there's a great diversity out there in the universe just in terms of supernovae. But one interesting thing about these type 1a supernovae is they tend to be roughly similar to each other. And that was one reason why they could be used as these cosmological probes, because they're roughly similar to each other. OK. So again, this is user spectra of type 1a supernovae, again, showing calcium, and silicon, sulfur, iron, uh, cobalt, nickel, things like that. You have to figure out how do you make something that shows, that you know, produces that, but doesn't have hydrogen and helium in it. And so that, I'm going to take a brief for it. Oh my gosh, it's 11.48. That's incredible. OK, <clears throat> let's see what we can do. Boy, um, time sure flies when you're having fun. So I'm going to go very quickly through the life cycle of the star, uh, life cycle of a star like the sun. And we'll see where we get to in the remaining time. So the sun is currently uh, what's called a main sequence star currently converting hydrogen into helium in its core. It's doing nuclear fusion in its core. So nuclear fusion, that's the process where you combine small nuclei and make bigger nuclei, and you liberate some energy out of it. And in the center of the sun, it's taking, essentially taking four protons, slamming them together, and getting a helium nucleus out. So two protons and two neutrons is helium nucleus. That's currently going on in the center of the sun. The nuclear fusion obviously doesn't happen just anywhere. It doesn't happen on Earth unless we really try very hard. Uh, and that's due to something like this plot, just showing the energy versus the distance of two protons in this case. Okay, so if you have two protons and you try to bring them closer and closer together, it takes more and more energy to do so. And they're repelling each other because of they're both positively charged. Right? The electromagnetic force tells you that like charges repel, and so you can't just take these two positive charges and bring them close together, they push on each other. So it's hard to do that. But if you can get over this barrier, there's a, you know, a lovely place uh, beyond the barrier where the two protons really want to be together. And that's due to the strong nuclear force. So the strong nuclear force is what holds big nuclei together. Even though there are a bunch of protons in these nuclei, a bunch of positive charges trying to push each other apart, the strong nuclear force is strong. And so it can hold these nuclei together. So if you can pass this barrier, you can do some nuclear fusion and stick, stick nuclei, or stick uh, these particles together. So that's what's happening in the center of the sun. These four protons are coming together and forming helium. Okay, I'm going to start accelerating because uh, time is crazy here. <clears throat> so here's the sun. At some point, it will exhaust this hydrogen fuel inside of the center. It will convert all of the hydrogen into helium. It will finish doing the nuclear fusion of all that hydrogen in the center into helium. And you'll end up with a star that's a helium core and a hydrogen shell on top. Okay, and that's called the red giant, the red giant phase, the red giant branch. That helium, once, it, once that core grows large enough, can also start to do fusion. So in a very analogous way that the protons are fusing into helium in five or six or seven or so billion years, the helium at the center of the, of the sun will start to do fusion. 
Okay, so here is a cartoon diagram of that helium fusion. So you, if you get them going fast enough and get them close enough, they can overcome this barrier, stick together because of the strong nuclear force, and give you some energy. And when you take helium and fuse it, you get proton, uh, six protons and six neutrons. That's carbon, carbon-12. Okay, if you add another one, you get oxygen, oxygen-16. Okay, so when you do helium fusion in the centers of stars, you'll get carbon and oxygen. Very good. Okay, so that will happen eventually in, you know, six or seven billion years. We'll form this core of carbon and oxygen at the center of uh, what will be a future sun. Okay, by that point, we'll be gone. We'll be long dead, but no, don't mind that. <coughs> That's called an asymptotic giant branch star. Okay. At the end of the day, it turns out the sun will not continue to do more fusion beyond carbon and oxygen. It'll stop with carbon and oxygen, it'll get rid of the shell, and it'll be left with this little core of carbon and oxygen. It's called a white dwarf. So our sun, in seven-ish billion years, will become a carbon and oxygen white dwarf. Right. And this is the end point of the stellar life cycle, or the stellar uh, evolution for the majority, actually the vast majority of stars in the Milky Way and, and in the universe. Most of them will go through these phases to become a carbon and oxygen white dwarf. Right, so they're extremely common, and they'll become even more common in the next you know, billions of years. It goes through what you call a nova stage, right? To get rid of the hydrogen fuel shell? Um, not quite. It's often called a planetary nebula, um, the, the, when the shell is leaving. And, there, and Nova is uh, something somewhat different. It's not an explosion. Uh, depends how you define an explosion, but not really. Not really. So there will be an ejection of material, but I think in the common way of thinking of the word explosion, it's not really an explosion. There's not a gravitational collapse. No, not in the case of stars like the sun. Okay. So that's what happens with the sun. The sun will not fuse, will not do nuclear fusion of the carbon and oxygen in 7 billion years. But it turns out, if you take carbon and oxygen and you fuse it in a very explosive manner, in a real explosion, you produce silicon, sulfur, iron, nickel, things like that, things that are what we see in type 1 supernovae. Okay, so in this sort of indirect route, um, the chemical fingerprints in type 1 supernova spectra is telling us what, it, what the star was before it exploded. It's telling us that there was very likely carbon and oxygen, and it went through an explosion, and that gave a type 1 supernova, producing the silicon and sulfur and iron and nickel that we see. But where did the energy come from to get over the hump? Excuse me? Where did the energy come from to get over that hump? Yeah, so uh, I, I didn't mention it. Sitting there. Oh, exactly, right. So the sun will become a cold carbon oxygen white dwarf. We do not expect the sun to explode. Okay? The majority of the carbon oxygen white dwarfs that will be formed and have formed in the universe will not explode except when a supernova. And we'll, I'll come back to that. Okay. Um, uh, since in the interest of time, I'll just say that type 1a supernovae, we see them in both young galaxies and old galaxies. So here's a lovely young galaxy, here's an old galaxy. Whatever is producing type 1a supernovae has to happen in stellar populations that are both young, say young, you know, less than 100 million years or so, so sort of young, but also old populations, more than 10 billion years. So you need something that's produced relatively, can be produced relatively quickly, but it has to stick around for a very, very long time. And that immediately tells you something. It tells you, for example, that type 1a supernovae do not happen from very short-lived stars. Okay? Because the short-lived stars are all gone after 10 billion years. Right? So that immediately tells you something. Okay, so putting together these pieces of evidence and also a host of other evidence that I, I didn't get into, okay, the fact that it takes a certain amount of time to rise to their light, to their maximum light, so it's roughly solar mass. From their chemical signatures, we know that it's probably some explosion of carbon and oxygen stuff. Okay, and it occurs in both young and old galaxies. It rules out a large class of stars. And the thing that we're left with at the end of the day is this statement. Okay, type 1a supernovae are due to the thermonuclear, again this fusion, explosions of carbon and oxygen white dwarfs that are roughly a solar mass in, in size, in, in mass. Okay, and this is a statement that uh, has been known for a long time. Okay, most people would have been very comfortable saying it in the 70s and 80s, maybe the 80s. And I would say that pretty much anyone in the supernova field would be happy with this statement. Okay, so there's no real uh, argument here. As you point, uh, yes? So it works that way because by the time our sun gets the carbon and oxygen level, it will no longer have one solar mass of solar material. Um, it is true. So the sun will be roughly 0.5 or so solar masses. It will have ejected another 0.5 solar masses. But that's not why. 
That's not why. So there are stars that form one, roughly one solar mass carbon oxygen white dwarfs, but even those likely will not explode. Because carbon oxygen white dwarf is very, very stable. It, it's streaming along with it essentially forever. If we came back to see the sun or one solar mass carbon oxygen white dwarf in 10, 20, 30 billion years, it would just be there. It would be cooling slowly. It would be very dim and it would be sad, but it would still be there. <laughs> so you need something, what these people are getting at, you need something to cause this very stable thing to explode. And the simplest idea is to have another star in this system, to have a binary stellar system. Okay, to have a companion star that somehow it causes this carbon and oxygen white dwarf to explode. And it turns out that actually most of the stars in the universe, or at least the Milky Way, are in binary systems or in multiple stellar systems. So in a sense, the sun is, is common, but it's also not it's exactly prototypical. A lot of other stellar systems have multiple stars in them, but the sun is just alone. Okay, so this addition, the addition of those few words, is still a statement I think that most supernova researchers would be very comfortable with. A lone carbon oxygen white dwarf shouldn't explode. There's no reason for it should to, to explode. You need some sort of interaction with the companion to somehow set it off. Okay? So I'd say maybe 90, 98% of supernova, type 1A supernova people would be happy with this statement. Something like that. I didn't do a poll, but that's what I feel. Okay, but going beyond that statement, uh, is really where, I wouldn't say we're stuck, but it's where we are trying to probe and trying to figure out the rest of that sentence is what, uh, is what occupies a lot of people. What is that companion? Okay. There are lots of kinds of, of binary stellar systems. What, which of those cause the carbon oxygen white dwarf to explode? And why do they cause the carbon oxygen white dwarf to explode? How, in their interaction, do they trigger an explosion inside this very stable carbon oxygen white dwarf? Uh, I have two minutes, okay, to get to the actual, um, what I wanted to talk about, which is, <laughs> what are our current models for this, these question marks? What are, what could the companions of these explosions be, and how could, how might they trigger these explosions? Okay, um, maybe five to ten more minutes? Yeah, yeah. I don't know, maybe you have to get to the dentist or lunch. Um, you know, feel free to leave, I will not be insulted overly. Okay, so uh, let me get into two of the main models that we as a community believe could be leading to type 1a supernovae. Again, you need a white dwarf and a binary stellar companion of some sort. And this uh, lovely picture drawn by my, uh, uh, back in the day, my grad student, grad student, uh, my office mate. Okay. He's now a researcher at uh, Carnegie Observatories. This is a, a cartoon image of a star like the sun okay, in a binary system with a white dwarf, which is here. And if the two stars get close enough, the white dwarf can start pulling matter off of the other companion. Okay, so it's pulling matter into what's called an accretion disk. The physics of that are really necessary for now, but it looks kind of cool. Uh, it's pulling matter into a disk that eventually accretes, you know, gets put on top of the white dwarf. And then through a series of things I won't get into, that white dwarf is growing in mass. It's pulling matter off its companion. It's growing in mass. And maybe that's what causes the carbon and oxygen to start doing nuclear fusion in the center of the star. And maybe that the increased densities and the increased temperatures somewhat at the center of this growing star, maybe then they can start doing this fusion. And they start to explode, they start to release some energy. That further release of energy heats the material up, makes it more reactive, and so the carbon and oxygen fusion continues and continues and grows. It leads to what's called a deflagration. Um, I have cool movies that I borrowed from friends, but uh, in the interest of time, I don't know if I can show them all. Let me just. Yeah, I know. I thought this was until 12 30. Yeah, we have. We, we have. We usually go until 12 30, which includes QA and kind of a very active question syndrome. Okay, okay. I will, I will continue. My, my dear leader, that's the only excuse. That's right. I'm not worth the parking ticket. Okay, so the carbon and oxygen nuclear fusion is happening and it's starting to get very exciting. It's starting to run away because, again, the fusion releases some energy. The energy helps the carbon and oxygen nuclei to continue to fuse. Okay, so it's a runaway reaction. We get the birth of a flame, a flame in the sense of a propagating wave that's burning. It's doing nuclear fusion behind it. In this movie, I'm going to show a very analogous case that's terrestrial combustion. So this is a simulation done of a methane-air mixture. Methane, you know, burns. Okay, it's a methane-air mixture burning inside of a tube uh, because the visualization is pretty cool. Okay, so here's the methane and air burning. 
you're going to see this, what's called a deflagration wave, start to move down this pipe. Uh, I'm going to speed it along. Okay. So there it's going. It's going down the pipe. All right. uh, a couple things to say about deflagration. So it's called a deflagration. There's an F-L-A-G in there. And a deflagration is a burning wave that's moving slower than the speed of sound. Okay, so the speed of sound is Mach 1. This is a subsonic burning wave. So it's just kind of propagating along. It's heating the fuel ahead of it, and the heat causes the fuel to burn. In this case, it's you know, doing chemical combustion. All right, so this deflagration wave is moving down the pipe in this simulation. Something very interesting happens. At some point, this deflagration wave will transition into a different kind of uh, chemical combustion. So you can see it's starting, and then it's very different, right? It's a very different way of burning. And that's called a detonation. Okay, so deflagration, detonation. The detonation is a supersonic flame. Okay, so the def deflagration was subsonic, moving slower than sound. The detonation is supersonic, it's moving faster than sound, and it's being propagated by a shock. Okay, so you might know shock waves, you look at you know, supersonic planes, they have these lovely shock uh, mock codes. So a shock wave is a supersonic, uh, a supersonic disturbance, and in the case of a detonation, it's a supersonic disturbance that's doing burning behind it. It turns out that for type 1a supernovae, you can't just have the deflagration. So at the center of this carbon monoxide white dwarf in the simulation, you've got a, defla a deflagration that's starting. So the deflagration is doing nuclear fusion, but it's being released subsonically, relatively slowly, doing fusion of carbon oxygen into other stuff, propagating out, but in a very analogous way, that deflagration can turn into a detonation, which is supersonic, moving much faster, and as you might imagine, the burning that happens is much more complete, it's much more efficient. Okay, so, uh, I guess I'll explain this movie now that I have the additional time. So this is the density of the simulation, inside the simulation, here's the carbon oxygen white dwarf. These four panels are showing uh, different chemical compositions. So the carbon oxygen white dwarf, this panel is showing the carbon, so here's the carbon, Here's the oxygen, right? There's carbon and oxygen. Okay. Right now, there's no silicon and sulfur, which is what this is showing, and there's no iron and cobalt and nickel. Okay. No, that hasn't been produced yet. We'll see as the simulation starts. Where is the? Oh. Okay. We get the birth of a deflagration. So it doesn't look quite as pretty, which is why I showed that other movie. But uh, it's a very similar kind of turbulent, wrinkled, you know, bubbly-looking thing that is the deflagration wave moving out into the star doing fusion of the carbon and oxygen, releasing energy and propagating the deflagration forward. You can see it's eating into the carbon and oxygen, it's turning them into, in this case, iron and nickel. All right, deflagration is continuing, continuing, and at some point we'll see the transition. How do I pause this thing? Okay, oops, I've gone too far. All right, so you see the birth of that detonation, just like that previous movie of methane and air, we see that deflagration turn into a very different way of doing nuclear fusion. In this case, it's doing a supersonic detonation. And that supersonic detonation is necessary for type 1a supernovae because it goes back, back through this deflagration stuff, and it burns it more efficiently, it burns it more completely. So you see these pockets of uh, carbon and oxygen that remain after the deflagration. The detonation is going to come back through and burn them. Okay. Without them, you don't get the right mix of stuff that we see in type 1a spectra. All right, so it came back through. Oops, I've gone too far. Okay, so let's just watch the movie. So the deflagration is going out. At some point, it becomes the detonation. The detonation goes out and also sweeps back in, and it finishes completely burning the rest of the carbon oxygen white dwarf into the correct mix of stuff that we observe in type 1a supernova spectrum. Okay, so this was a really good thing. This was you know, this was this exact model was you know, manipulated. Uh, sorry, uh, added onto in the, in the 90s or so. But this has basically been the standard scenario for Type 1a supernovae for decades, or in the 80s. Okay, and when I was in graduate school in the mid 2000s, this is the standard scenario I learned. This is how you make a Type 1a supernovae. You have a companion that's maybe like the sun. It's pulling matter onto the white dwarf. It's putting matter onto the white dwarf. The white dwarf grows. You get this deflagration and a detonation, and that explosion looks like a type 1 system. Like that. Was that based on a 2D or 3D simulation? Or this, is, um, this is a pretty sure a 2D simulation, but 3D simulations have been done as well. Okay. <clears throat> By 2D, two dimensional and three dimensional. Okay, so this was the textbook scenario. This is what 
Astronomer parents told their astronomer children to put them to bed at night. <laughs> Um, but really, you know, so some cracks in that story had been present all along, but some really major cracks started appearing when I was at the end of grad school in, in the late 2000s. And I just want to point out one of them, uh, because it was uh, developed and really put forward by a current professor at Berkeley, Dan Faison. And the idea is this. So here's your companion star. Here's your white dwarf. Let's say it explodes. Okay, let's say you can get it to the point where it explodes. It becomes a type 1 supernova. That star's still there. And it's going to get hit really hard by all this supernova stuff. The supernova stuff is leaving at tens of thousands of kilometers a second, right? When it hits that star, something should happen. That star will get hit very hard, it'll get heated, okay? So that might change what it looks like. And the, in an equal and opposite sort of sense, that star is hitting back on the supernova ejecta, right? And so it changes the energetics of the supernova ejecta in a way that might be present when you look at the light curve of a supernova, you should be able to see the effect that the companion had on, on the light curve. And so, uh, just a visualization, this is that companion, here's the supernova ejecta, you know, exploding outwards. But that companion is a pretty big uh, influence on the supernova ejecta, okay? And so, you can do the calculation, what does that do to my light curves of supernova, my predicted light curves, do they match what we see? Does that change what this companion looks like? If we go back, for example, to Tycho's supernova remnant, that first slide I showed, we look at the center of the supernova remnant, is that companion there? Is that funny companion that's been hit really hard by a supernova there? Uh, and let me just say, the answer is no. Okay, the companion is not there. We don't see the effects of a companion on the type 1a light curve. Yes? Well, I was just going to ask about the orientation. If we happen to be looking at it from you know, directly through the companion, mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, he's asking, if we were at a telescope here, if this is where Earth is, and you're looking right down the tube, so to speak, this is all where all, a lot of the interaction with the companion is happening. That's where you see most of the effect. And actually, if you're on this side, the supernova stuff is blocking that interaction. You don't see it as much. So just on the basis of one supernova, you can't say, well, maybe we got unlucky, and we're over here, and so we don't see the companion. But we, as you've seen, have seen a ton of type 1a supernovae. And none of them, the compilation of all of them, doesn't show any sign of this effect. So to a statistical, in a statistical way, in a very strong statistical way, we can say that this companion is not there for the majority, the vast majority of type 1 Okay. All right, so there are really large cracks that were starting to appear in this standard scenario when I was in graduate school, and they persist to this day. Uh, and it was actually very interesting, since I can tell a little story at time, it's very interesting as a young graduate student to see how the community was changing. So this scenario had been around for decades, and people had spent decades doing research on it, building research groups to do these simulations, right, their whole careers. Uh, it was really, you know, entrenched in the supernova community. But in a period of, I'd say, five to ten years, because of cracks like this and a whole host of other observational clues, this standard scenario doesn't look so great anymore. And much to their credit, all these research groups have started to shift gears and explore all these different avenues. And it's given me a lot of faith in the scientific process because, you know, this is a very strongly held view. Really, a lot of people believe in it and are doing research in it. Uh, and it was very uh, heartening to see how quickly, in the face of new evidence, the scientific community can change and, and you know, really accept new evidence as for what it is. And not just cling to their beliefs because that's what they know. That apparently caused the uh, <laughs> controversy. <laughs> okay. Just, to, just briefly, uh, how do they know that the absence of the companion star is not simply that it joined in the supernova explosion? In other words, that it was hit so hard that it fused and blew? Mm -hmm. So you can do calculations of what you expect the sun or something like it to do when it gets hit with the supernova. And while the supernova is very powerful, the sun is also you know, pretty big. And so you do things to it, but you don't cause it to explode. Besides, uh, not being able to observe the effects of a companion star, why would not the uh, uh, white dwarf be, uh, why would not the star that becomes the white dwarf have drawn in the matter from its companion star before it became the white dwarf? Because at that time, it would have more mass. Right, so you're saying, you know, what about the interaction before the star became a white dwarf? Absolutely, lots of stars, lots of systems do precisely that, to interact before becoming white dwarfs. But in that case, you don't expect the resulting white dwarf to explode. You're going to form a white dwarf, and it'll just sit there like the other white dwarfs, right? So white dwarfs are very stable. If you form the white dwarf, you need to do something to it later on in its evolution to cause it to explode. 
Okay, right. So in the past, you know, I'd say 2010 was a real shift in the way the supernova community started believing, not believing, started thinking about type 1a supernova progenitors. And in the remaining uh, few minutes, let me just highlight one of my favorite, favorite, one of my favorite supernova progenitors, one that I think holds a lot of promise. It has a different companion. Instead of a star like the sun, it has another white dwarf. Okay. So there are indeed many systems out there that consist of two white dwarfs orbiting around each other. And in some of those systems, they can start to interact in some way. And in this particular simulation, we'll see them interact in a very exciting way. So here are two white dwarfs. This is uh, the one that's donating matter. This is the one that's accreting the matter, keeping it, and it's the one that will explode eventually. Uh, sorry, and I'll say this is the density. Okay, so this is the density. This is a plot of the temperature. It's currently blank because the beginning of the simulation, everything's cold, but it'll heat up, don't worry. And this is the atomic weight. It's telling you what the stuff is. Okay, and so currently it's yellowish. It's carbon and oxygen. These two, these two white dwarfs are carbon and oxygen. So let's start the simulation. This actually goes on for a long time. This white dwarf is donating material to this other white dwarf. This continues for hundreds of seconds. Still going, still going. Pause it at some point. Okay. <clears throat> You can start to see that this white dwarf that's accreting matter is keeping matter. The matter that's being dumped onto it is hot, right? Because it's coming in from very high up, and when it slams onto the surface of the white dwarf, that energy turns into heat. And so the temperature of this material is hot. All right. Which way is the material flowing? Is the one star much heavier than the other one? <sighs> they want to say this because this is also a confusing thing. This is a more massive star, but it's smaller. Uh, smaller in radius. Okay. So both of them are roughly the size of the Earth. White dwarfs are roughly the size of the Earth. Uh, but they both have masses roughly the size of the Sun. And when you get something that dense, um, the parameters of the star change in such a way that the more massive a star is, the smaller it is in radius. Which is confusing. But this is the more massive star, and that's why it's pulling matter off of the other star. Okay. So this continues for a little bit of time. Continues. Maybe I should have shortened the movie. All right, so we've slowed down. Uh, simulation has slowed down, and that's because something very exciting is about to happen. Okay, so here is the matter being accreted, dumped onto the other white dwarf. And you can see that these spots are very bright. It's very hot there. Okay, the material is very hot. And at these high temperatures, you can start to do fusion. That's great. So now they have some way of triggering this explosion. And the trigger is not because of the growth of the white dwarf due to accretion from some star like the sun. It's due to this rapid dumping of material. You know, this is hundreds of seconds, right? That's nothing in a cosmological sense. So it's a very rapid dumping of material, and that rapid dumping material is causing these very, very hot points on the surface of this white dwarf. And those hot points can turn into a detonation, this supersonic burning front. Oh, man. <laughs> There's got to be a better way to control this. Yeah, we'll let it run. There it goes, okay? Wow. So there was a giant detonation that happened on the surface of this star. And it was triggered by this rapid dumping of material on, the, on this other white dwarf. And again, this is hundreds of seconds. I, I neglected to say in that other scenario, the standard scenario, the accretion, the mass transfer, was happening over millions of years. Okay, so it's a very different kind of way to do this. Uh, and, the, and the explosion started in the very center of the white dwarf after it grew because of that accretion. Here, there's no real growth. It's just you know getting slammed on top by this other white dwarf, and that slamming is what causes the detonation to happen. It's hundreds of seconds. It's real time, not, not in just model time. It's real time. That's right. This simulation. Oh yeah, this simulation uh, was done by a, a group of people in Germany, um, and I don't know the exact time, but many, many, many uh, processors for weeks. Hundreds of real seconds, that's right. <coughs> but weeks of computational time. I'm not concerned about that so much, but it only takes 100 seconds for this thing to happen. That's right. We see it here. <laughs> sure. There are more movies coming up, though. <laughs> but I mean, I'll skip so over. far, all of the surface has exploded, right? That's absolutely right. Uh, that's that's absolutely right. right. You've done. You've done. You're reading. This is so. I would be oh, so he's, he's intuitive. Okay. Spanish. There it goes. There goes the surface explosion. But in this case, we see a shadow. From that. Yeah. Oh, we're not done. We're not done. <laughs> the story continues. I still have 14 minutes. 
Okay, so as was very astutely pointed out, that was only an explosion on the surface of this white dwarf. Actually, they have other simulations where more happens, but that was not the version I was able to get from them. This is now just um, the white dwarf that will explode. And we're going to see that uh, detonation happening on the surface of the white dwarf. And it'll wrap around, and something very interesting will happen at the center of this white dwarf. Okay? So again, this is the white dwarf that had stuff dumped on it, and it had a surface detonation, a, su a surface supersonic nuclear fusion flame going around it. Um, and this picture is of a bullet going through air, I believe, and it's showing what's called a mock cone. So it's a supersonic bullet, and the, the, one of the effects of that supersonic bullet is to propagate out this uh, shock wave that looks like that. Yes? Yeah, what kind of atoms are causing this surface detonation? That's a great question. Those are great questions. <laughs> um, so I've been talking a lot about carbon and oxygen fusion, and that's what causes the type 1a eventually. In this simulation, uh, and in cell evolution, it turns out carbon and oxygen white dwarfs have a layer of helium on top. Okay. And so this helium is what's being transferred onto the surface of this carbon and oxygen white dwarf. And it's helium fusion that's the surface detonation. Oh, oh yes. So what causes the helium to begin to move? Ooh, okay. Good. <coughs> no, I didn't, you know. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> I love it. You're on this. Two white dwarfs. Okay, they're born very far apart. Um, in these kinds of systems, very is a relative term, but again, these, these white dwarfs are roughly the size of the Earth. Okay, their initial orbits are roughly the size of the Sun. The Sun is much larger than the Earth. So while the Sun is relatively small in a cosmological sense, these white dwarfs are very far apart initially. As they're orbiting around each other, okay, if you do an analysis with uh, general relativity, with GR, you'll see that they are emitting gravitational waves. So they're, they're perturbing the, met, the very metric of, you know, the very space-time itself, and that's carrying away some energy. So your space-time wiggling, and it carries away these gravitational waves. Okay. That takes away energy, and that causes this orbit to come together slowly over millions of years. And it's shrinking, they're still rotating around each other, they're still sending out gravitational waves, and it brings them closer and closer. And so finally, one of the white dwarfs, that one on the right, starts to transfer some matter. So now they're just close enough, they're only a few uh, Earth radii apart, where the gravitational influence now at the surface of this star, it's also, it's being pulled on so much by this star that it starts to just be transferred over. Okay. So general relativity is causing these white dwarf systems to eventually come into contact, start to interact. Is it the helium that's first transferred? Absolutely. So the helium is on top, and that's what is precisely is first transferred over to the carbon oxygen white dwarf. Does this rotation produce gravitational waves that we might be able to detect or detect? That's right. So um, actually, in the news, you might have just heard advanced LIGO came online. So it's a gravitational wave observatory on Earth. So that does not detect these gravitational waves. That, that's pitched at a higher frequency, so to speak, of gravitational waves. These gravitational waves, um, well, you can see the orbital periods are roughly hundreds of seconds. So it's a different, uh, it's a different parameter space. So that thing that just came online won't see these. <laughs> But if funding had gone through, and funding, I think, in Europe is still going through for uh, a space-based gravitational wave detector, this turns out to be one of the dominant signals for that detector is uh, these orbiting white dwarfs spiraling towards each other. Okay. <coughs> Ripples in space-time. Cool. All right, so that was the movie. Good. So this is a different simulation showing what happens to that white dwarf when a surface helium-powered detonation happens. And again, there's this mock cone, right? And I put that there to show you for a reason. Let me pause it. Catch it in time. Oh, too fast, so fast. Okay. So the helium detonation is going around the surface of this white dwarf here. This blue line is showing something very analogous to this mock cone. So the helium detonation is going around, and as it goes around, it sends in something like, sort of like, uh, this shock wave. It's sending a shock wave into the center of this carbon and oxygen white dwarf. And as that carbon, that shock wave comes together here, it's getting really focused. It's sending a lot of energy into a very, very small amount of volume. And it's that focusing, that collection of all that shock energy into a small region that causes fusion, <coughs> that causes the carbon and oxygen fusion. Right, so if it weren't for that converging set of shock waves, you only had the helium shell detonating, 
you wouldn't get a type 1a supernova. You'd get you know, something sort of interesting. I actually wrote part of my thesis on that. But it's not a type 1a supernova. It's just the small shell. So to get the whole core to go requires this convergence of all these shock waves that are being sent in by the helium detonation. So the helium detonation triggers a carbon detonation. And that's why this scenario is called the double detonation scenario. Right? There are two detonations. Okay? So it's a double detonation scenario. As a brief aside, to draw a connection to terrestrial uh, things, <clears throat> down over in East Bay, there's something called the National Ignition Facility. And this is a facility that's shooting a ton of lasers on a little pellet of uh, fusionable material with the concepts of making fusion happen. So there are a whole bunch of lasers in here, basically focused on a small region of something uh, called a, whatever, what it's called is not important. Uh, and there's a little pellet of fusionable material. And all the energy being focused in a very small region will cause that material to fuse and undergo nuclear fusion. And a slightly, um, there are reasons that this is controversial. I'll leave that to you to figure out. Uh, in a less controversial, but not quite as applicable way, I'm showing these uh, really cool images uh, of what's called the pistol shrimp, or snapping shrimp. And this is a shrimp that's a fairly common shrimp. and has one pincer that's a giant, and another pincer that's basically uh, not as useful. This pincer is really cool. Okay. It's, snap it's very big, it's very powerful, it snaps shut. And when it does so, it ejects a little stream of water really fast fast enough that it causes a bubble to form. So it's in the deep sea, but it is able to cause a bubble. Cavitation. Exactly, it's called cavitation. And when that bubble collapses, in an analogous way to the shock waves converging, <laughs> this bubble collapses and concentrates a bunch of energy in a very small region, and it leads to a, the formation of a shock, right? A very you know, destructive sound wave going out. And it uses, this shrimp uses that cavitation bubble collapsing shock wave to knock its fish, its prey out. So it you know, does that, so it can kind of fire a gun at these fish from a safe distance, knock them out, and go and collect and have dinner. Okay. So it's a very analogous thing. You convert, can converge a lot of energy in a small region, and you can do exciting things. In the case of a, the double detonation scenario, the shock waves are coming from this helium shell detonation. Converging shock waves towards the center cause the carbon detonation. Can you see the rest of it? Did you stop <clears throat> They stopped the simulation because they didn't actually do that explosion. Uh, oh, that was the end. That's the end. Oh. You want to see it again? Well, there you go. All right, convergence, convergence, getting stronger and stronger. Boom! And you can imagine if the simulation had continued to compute, it would explode. Okay. This has a lot of great things going on for it that I won't get into, um, just to compare it, the one thing that was wrong, one of the main things that was wrong with this standard textbook scenario from a few slides ago, it doesn't have this issue. There is a companion there, but it's another white dwarf. It's very small. It's the size of the Earth. And so for various reasons, you don't expect to get the same... <laughs> it's very exciting. <laughs> you don't expect to get the same sort of signatures in type 1a supernovae, in the early parts of type 1a supernovae light curves, from a companion that's very small. And so our observations are still in line with this sort of model where the companion is small, you know, produce these features that are, that are a problem. Um, so the companion does not get drawn into the explosion and also fires up themselves? Not, not in this model. Uh -huh. and there are other variations, okay? So there, I could have talked for a very long time about the different generative scenarios. This one happens to be my favorite, uh, so it's why I, I turned out to highlight it. But there are other scenarios, for example, one in which the other white dwarf is actually tidally you know, stretched and, and disrupted into just material that sits on top of the other white board. <clears throat> okay, so I didn't want to, uh, these are not, again, the only two scenarios, this standard scenario with another star like the sun and this scenario with another white dwarf. There are other scenarios, and it could very well be that type 1a supernovae are not just due to one specific scenario. It could be a combination of the two. It could be a uh, third or fourth ones that I didn't talk about. It could be other ones that people haven't even thought of yet. So this is very much an active field. Um, it's a very exciting field, both just because type 1a supernovae, again, are so interesting, uh, but also because of the way that the community is uh, in flux right now. It's really shifting and, and very open to exploring new ideas and new physical processes. Uh, and I hope uh, I've been able to uh, share some of the energy that, uh, and the excitement that motivates me on a daily basis to do this kind of research. And happy to take any more questions.
was similar to what they thought. So if you remember the, the flavors they showed, they weren't exactly the same. They had the correct light ratio. There was actually a decent variance in how bright they were and what they looked like. And so there was some variation. Uh, and it turns out that the scenario and other scenarios like the other I showed at the end of the talk explain that variation very nicely. So they're roughly similar. You know, it's roughly a solar mass and stuff exploding. But it's maybe 90% of the solar mass or 120% of the solar mass. That gives you the variation that's seen in those light curves. I'm sorry, yeah, so I, I, I guess I didn't explain that very well. The, those uh, corrections were for the intrinsic luminosity, the actual luminosity of the supernova, if, it were, if we knew what its distance was. So those, those differences were due to the actual explosion itself, not how far it was. And because we knew how to make those corrections, then we could use them in the far away galaxies to say how far away. Did I go past it? I went past it. Hold on. It's happening. We're getting there. Not that one. This one. Okay. So this was that, again, that standard scenario. Uh, where's my pointer? Here we go. All right, I'll use this pointer. And this panel is showing things like silicon and sulfur, and this panel is showing things like iron and nickel. And it's a density-dependent uh, nuclear fusion reaction. So at these lower densities, you produce silicon and sulfur. The very high densities you produce iron, cobalt, nickel, things like that. And so type 1 and supernova have this structure where it's like the onion skin on the surfaces, it's more silicon and sulfur, and the very core, it's this stuff. Um, so, um, when I heard of the, the shock absorption of the light one, like, well, what was that on the light one?
Okay, so again, here's the periodic table. More massive things have higher numbers. Iron and cobalt nickel is the end, basically the end of the fusion of the Tequani supernova. But there's a whole bunch of stuff down here that is not produced in large amounts of Tequani supernova. <coughs> there are other nuclear processes, but actually the way, you know, fully robustly producing what we see uh, of these elements in the sun and around is not actually known. So there are other ways to do it and to start approaching uh, the abundances of some of these elements that we see, but it's not fully uh, understood yet. So there are, for example, core collapse supernovae, a whole different class of supernovae to talk about, where the inner core collapses and liberates energy and that explodes the rest of the star. And you do get a different mix of stuff there, but you don't necessarily burn up to, you know, fuse up to these really massive things. Um, other, it's not exotic, other ways that are, are thought to lead to that kind of stuff is, for example, taking two neutron stars and allowing them to merge. When you do that, you get a very exciting and different uh, nuclear synthetic product. And that's one way it's thought perhaps that you get a lot of this sort of stuff. Okay, one more question. Sure, sure. Uh, anyone not ask a question? Because the sun is less massive, it has less of a, uh, if I drop something onto it, there's less energy than if I were to take a more massive asteroid and drop some thoughts on it. And so the temperature reach during the merger, or during the interaction of a 0.5 sun asteroid, the temperatures don't get as hot. And so in that case, the helium doesn't get hot enough to start doing this nuclear fusion. And you would get something interesting, you would get perhaps the formation of a different kind of star, there probably wouldn't be an explosion. Uh, but you can form different kinds of stars, and indeed, that's one of the main formation mechanisms for certain classes of stars. So it's mergers, interactions of uh, white dwarf systems, where they don't explode, but they leave 